We <laughs> takes a while for this thing to come up. We're on Derech Hashem, page eighty-six. Here we go. The Ramchal elaborates on the limitations of the soul while it is trapped in the flawed body in this world. He says, moreover, the soul also loses out. And he says in fifty five one fifty five, we would have thought that the soul does not lose out at all by having its essence subdued within the body. This would be analogous to a wealthy person who has all of his assets intact, but for some reason cannot offer any of them to others. The wealth, though, is still there. So again, moreover, the soul also loses out for it is sub, uh, subdued inwardly and is not able to radiate outwardly. Furthermore, it cannot perform its proper task, which is the purification of the body. <coughs> if it were to perform that task of purification, the soul would be <coughs> greatly perfected in two ways. Firstly, from the perspective of the very nature of the task, for it is an act of perfection, imparting good and perfecting another. A further reason why the soul would be uh, become more perfected through the purification of the body is that it is, that this is the appropriate task befitting the soul in accordance with its nature and makeup, for it was created for this purpose. And any being attains this perfection when it accomplishes what it, what its creator accomplished or ordained it to accomplish, and it lacks perfection uh, as long as it does not fulfill that task. Okay, so that's where he's going with this, that the soul has a specific task. That task is to perfect the body. Of course, we can't perfect the body because, as we said, uh, the sin of Adam sullied it in such a manner that the only way to totally perfect it is to die, to decompose, to come back, and then we can perfect the body. But until that time, we can't perfect it totally, but we can perfect it as much as possible. So that's very important to remember. So I saw a very nice midrash on this. It goes like this, that the soul and the body are partners, right? We're all partners. Good. And what happens? When we want to sin, we have an interesting way of sinning. What we do is the soul blames it on the body. The body wants it, the body wants this, the body wants that. So the soul, uh, and it forces the soul to do it. The, bo- the soul says, uh, the body, sorry, the body says to God, I'm just the vehicle. The soul really wanted it. If the soul wouldn't have wanted it, I wouldn't have done it. You understand how this is working? So they each blame one another. So the rabbis compare it to a king who has a vineyard. Uh, uh, an orchard, excuse me, an orchard with a beautiful tree where the fruits are very expensive and he wants to guard them but he knows if he he gets a regular health uh, able-bodied person to guard them the odds are that he'll take fruit for himself, he doesn't want to lose any of the fruit because that that valuable, so what he does is he gets a blind man uh, and a lame man Okay? So the blind man can't see the fruit to take it. And the lame man can't walk to get the fruit, although he can see it. So they're sitting there all day, and then what happens is the blind man says to the lame man, wait a second, if you go on my shoulders, then we can get the fruit. Both of us can eat. So the, blind, so the lame man gets on the blind man, he walks off to the fruit. He directs them to the tree, and they take from the fruit, and they eat. Ah, uh, very good. Now what happens is the king comes back and knows that some of the fruit is gone. How he knew that, I don't know. But he knows that some of the fruit is gone. And he's, he looks to the blind man and he says, who ate the fruit? He said, I, I can't see. I don't know who ate the fruit. And he goes to the lame man. He said, who ate the fruit? He said, I can't walk. How would I ever get to that fruit? So then he says, aha. Both of you are going to be punished now. You're both equally responsible. What that Midrash is saying is a very important element here. The soul cannot claim to God, I didn't have the power to perfect the body. It can't do anything like that. It has to do its job. The body, at the same time, can't, can't claim 
the other way that I did. I wasn't responsible either. I'm just I'm just the the motor for this soul. They are both equally responsible, and that gets back to the Yitzhahara, Yitzhatov. All these things come together where each one has to work in consonance all to serve God. So the Period. Tzaddikim then are the role models for the ability, the, the ability, the parameter of the ability for the soul to purify the body in this world. They show us that it can be done. Yes. When a person is a tzaddik, when a person is acting righteously and living that out, they are living proof that it can work that way. Okay? Similar to, by the way, uh, the Jews. When God gave us the 613 commandments, uh, of which we have to follow, so one is that, like I've said many times, we cannot follow all 613. It's impossible for me to do it. It's totally impossible. Why? Because I'm not a rich man. I'm not, think I'm not a poor man. Okay, so I'm not a woman. I'm not a king. I'm not a lady. I'm not, there's so many things I'm not. I'm not a farmer. So there's not a lot of nots. Each one of those positions has their own specific mitzvot, those specific commandments. We all have approximately, I think it comes out, if, according to the Chafz Chaim, uh, about 265 that we can all do and that we have to do. But those which I cannot do and that you can do or that you can do as a medical professional, okay, so namely heal the sick. I can't do it. I'm not a doctor. So... We, because we're all combined with cultural arrangements that was that, that we're all integrally guarantors for each other. So when you do your mitzvah and you do your mitzvah and I do my mitzvah, we all work together. We all get the ding, ding, ding reward that we're going to do. And we all fulfill the mitzvah because we're all part of that body. Okay? So that's how that all works. So now, if a person is a... So what was it, what's my point? People would always say that, and this was a claim of the, the Christian world, that it, Paul, I think, said it. You can't, it's impossible to fulfill all the mitzvot. Am I correct? Basically, that's what he said. I'm not quoting here, but it's impossible. Nobody can do it. And the answer was, no, we're living proof that it can be done. And that's what God wanted. He said, I'm, I'm making a system which everybody is going to think is an impossibility. But you, my special people, are going to show that it's possible. So that's the grandiose picture. Now for your, to come to, uh, to us, we say, oh my God, it's so hard to get this, with all this responsibility that I have, it's just so hard. Just, I can't do it all. So the tzaddik comes around, we see the embodiment of a tzaddik, and he says, I don't find that difficult. <laughs> and so he's living proof, or she's living proof, that it can be done. So once we have that model, we have nothing to say. And that's, that's why we need those people in the world. Hopefully, those people become us. We become them. Right, I'm sorry. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we don't, I don't want, we want to come It's like the Borg. <laughs> it's resistance is futile. But it's, uh, okay. <laughs> right. We want to become like them. They are our role models, so we look to them, and that's what we try to emulate. Mm -hmm. But you're right. So that they are living proof that it can be done, and there's no excuse. What the Midrash is pointing out is also just a balancing act that I can't blame the other part of me. Flip Wilson was great for that. The devil made me do it, for those who remember Flip Wilson. Okay? But it's, uh, that was, it's not true. There's no such thing as somebody's making me do it. And that's what he's, that's what the Midrash is trying to get across, and that's what he's trying to get across. What the, the soul can't say, I wasn't, I wasn't responsible, I tried my best. No, no, no. There's no such thing. It's never, you can never stop doing what you have to do. Try, there is no try. There's no try, there's no only do? Okay. Thank Who you says that? Yoda. Who's that? Yoda. Oh, yeah. Well, Hashem, we got Flip Wilson, Star Wars, we're getting in. We got all the things. Okay. Uh, so, is there anything else over here that we need to do? But the proverb works better in oh. the original Klingon. Oh, there you go. Okay, and so let's just go through these notes because it'll help you out here. He says in 157 that there are two, there were, these are the two disadvantages of the soul being connected to the flawed body in this world. It cannot spread its radiance and it cannot perfect the body. 
which because it's not working that way. So the Ramchal now proceeds to explain from the positive, positive aspect what would be accomplished by the souls perfecting the body. This is common to the Ramchal to the first define what is lost and then to describe what could be gained or accomplished. The very act of giving, of, of giving produces a degree of perfection. Hence, were the soul able to purify the body as it was originally intended to do, my words, the soul would be more perfected. Rav Chaim Friedlander cites the Ramchal, where he states that it is the nature of one who is good to impart of his goodness. And that is Hashem's desire in creating the world to share of his goodness with the creation. When one emulates Hashem and imparts of his goodness to others, he acquires an even greater degree of goodness. So that's something else we have to, as long as we're emulating God and we're imparting that goodness because we don't, and this is again from the Tom and Devar and other, uh, in his other book, The Path of the Just, this, this is a common theme, that if I emulate God, and what does that mean? God has attributes, 13 attributes that we call, that we say he's merciful and so on and so forth. If I bring, if I act in that manner, as I want Hashem to act towards me, that brings that element into the world. If I don't, I can't expect it from God. So if somebody comes to my door and says, uh, they're looking for tzedakah, they're looking for charity, because well, for whatever reason, they're, 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 there's a whole bunch of reasons that people give, they, they're sick, whatever else. If I don't take out my checkbook or my whatever I'm going to do, and write them out a check, as small or as, as small as it's going to be. If I don't do that, when I suddenly cry out to God and say, Rabbi Yishalem, Master of the Universe, when it hurts I'm a turtle plan, if I was a rich man, God will say to me, yep, because you didn't give to the little God that I sent to you. You were so specific on your money, then you don't deserve it. That's it. Same way, if I don't show compassion to somebody, then when I pray daily for compassion, God says to me, no, you judge that person according to what it was, straight, yes or no, guess what? That's what I'm going to do to you. What we call meter connected meter, tit for tat, yep. What's the difference between discernment and judgment then? What's that mean? Discernment means you have to be able to weigh and balance a person's actions, whether you want to get involved with that kind of person or whether you feel that spiritually you need to keep distance, well, that isn't judging or is it judging? Are you allowed to have discernment as opposed to judgment? Is judgment, judgment simply is condemning ju someone for what they do but not saying because you do what you do, I can't join with you on that because I feel that's wrong? That would be discernment. So then the line for judgment is, not only do I feel what you're doing is wrong, but you will be punished for that. So that's stepping... Well, so step I'm, so certainly I'm allowed to do judgment. No, because, you're allowed to do discernment. No, no, no. I, I knew what I was saying. Oh, sorry. I'm certainly allowed to, to judge. In other words, if I'm a judge, well, I have no, to make a decision. No, average person. No, so I have to decide if I want to be with you or not. I have to. It says... Stay away from a bad neighbor. Okay, okay. So it says stay question. away from these bad elements because otherwise, we all know one thing. If I, if I go with a bad person, bad again, bad only means I'm not following, they're not following Torah. Right. It doesn't mean that they have to be Hitler. Right, right, right. Okay, it's just somebody who's not following Torah. If I'm going, if I'm going to go into those circles, so then the odds are heavy that I'm going to be assimilated to their thought and not the other way around. It's the rabbis compare it to, I walk into a uh, tannery, I didn't touch anything, I come out smelling like the tanning process. Or my, my favorite thing is you walk into, well today, I don't know, they don't, it doesn't work these days because of the no smoking bans. But it used to be that when you walked into a bar, Everybody was smoking there. Even though I didn't drink, even though I didn't smoke, I walk out, you smell smoke on me. I can't, I have to really take a shower to get rid of that. It doesn't matter how long I'm out, my clothes have it, everything has it. It was amazing because one, I remember one, my parents were smokers and I, so 
my my clothes absorb that stuff and i put it into somebody's closet and i opened the closet and i was whoa that's what it smelled like it was amazing that's that you know that you had to get clean stuff you had to really wash it out to get rid of that smell this disgusting smell but because i was always around it secondhand smoke i didn't think twice about it so that's the same thing with sinning if i'm sinning if i'm going to be with those people then i'm going to not think twice about what they're doing so then why was that? so i'm going to give you a story about this a very interesting story I've said it many times there was a rabbi who came over from europe nice old gen uh, I, I forget which rebbe he was but he came over from europe and it was shabbos and he saw a jew driving on shabbos he fainted fainted couldn't believe that a jew would drive on shabbos not supposed to drive so he couldn't believe it. faint faints the chassidim wake him up okay and they, they said rebbe rebbe is anything wrong he said i, I I must have been imagining. I saw a Jew drive on Shabbos. I said, you did, he did. He fainted again. <laughs> they didn't want to wake him. They didn't want to tell him again the third time. So they let it go. The next week, he, see, he sees another Jew driving, different Jew. And he sits and he, cry, he cries. Cries. So they said to him, Rabbi, I don't understand. Last week, you saw somebody drive on Shabbos. You fainted. This week, you cried. He said, that's the point. Last week, I fainted. This week, I didn't faint. I was already sensitized, desensitized, so I cried. Mm. Okay, so that's a Rebbe. We don't do that. What we do is we just every, let everybody live as they're going to because we're in America and we don't think twice about it. We say, nevech, 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 pity, but we really don't get that involved in it. And that's the sad part about the assimilation that we have, that even we who maintain that we're religious and we care about the other guy, we're not crying when they're doing something wrong. We should be. But that's a lack of sensitivity that we all have. Mm -hmm. So now your question was, I'll let now your the question. The question is if, if we are allowed, and even in, in some circumstances, it's commanded that we have a sense of judgment, why would, he, why would Hashem have judged that person you first brought up harshly? He said, you judged, and so... No, I'm saying somebody comes and asks for, uh, asks for something. There is for uh, let's say mercy on something uh -huh, okay uh -huh. that's within the, the bounds uh -huh. in other words i have um there's always great 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 areas to everything uh -huh. it's not black and white uh -huh. so if something if i could judge somebody to the side of merit okay he some again they come to you with their tzedakah or whatever they're doing or they they ask you for something so you have to you know judge at that point is this a true or not true and once you've once you can give the person a side of merit so then you do that's all he's saying that's all i'm saying with that if i know a person to be a real russia a real wicked person there's nowhere i can go with that yeah. then i have to say you know what it is yeah. and that's why you'll have you know the famous response is my father used to do it and i think you told me you're you or somebody used to do it with you uh not with you personally but but you saw it too? But somebody told me. Oh, no, Bill. Bill used to do it. When somebody would come to my father for uh, for money, he knew my father knew the guy just wanted a drink. So, he, But he said, I want, I want to buy some food. I need some money for food. My father would say, oh, you need that? Come. He would bring it to Dunkin' Donuts or one of the others. Whatever you want. He would tell the, the waitress, whatever he wants, it's on me. Go ahead. The guy said, no, no, I, I don't want that. I, I need to buy food. He said, this is food. He said, no, not, not that food. He said, I don't buy drinks. You want food? Do this. You want to go across the street? I'll do the same thing. It was a, uh, a grocery store. You want to go across the street? You want to get food? I'll go there with you. Same deal. It's on me. I don't want that. You're a nutty man. Okay, that's it. So, okay, so my father would do it that way. He wasn't interested in buying uh, drinks for this guy, but he said, you want food? I can give you food. Tell them the story. It was the same story, the same story? Uh, it was the story that I told you about the guy. I, I had a half a loaf, I had a loaf of bread to my name. Uh-huh. Absolutely no money. And uh, right. guy wanted a dollar for a hamburger. I said, I don't have a dollar. I don't have any money, but I have a fresh loaf of bread. I'll give you half of it. Well, I really wanted a hamburger. I said, so would I, you know, I'd like one too, but all I have is this loaf of bread. You're welcome to have right. it. Right. 
The other week, I was waiting on a red light over by Walmart, and I watched one of these guys who stands in the road with his sign, will work for food, dire straits. Somebody gave him a fresh loaf of bread. Watched him go to the, look around, go to the dumpster at the oil change place and toss the bread in. Okay. Uh, you know, at that point, it makes it hard to have... Compassion. Compassion for... Okay. Again, you have to, like, that's, I'm not, you have to make that judgment. If yeah. the guy is just, uh, no good, you see something happening. So you don't, it's, it's not even a judgment. You're seeing what he's doing. I don't even have to judge the person. So it's, uh, but that's. Well, I was just curious as to how far we are, what the parameters of what is the requirement of us, because we are the chosen people, to be more compassionate than other people, or just as if we make a judgment and say, this guy is a panhandler and he isn't being fair. He doesn't really want the compassion. He wants the money so he can go do whatever he wants to do with it. Are we still, that was my question, are we still commanded to be compassionate to people like that or can we just say, nah, you're not being legitimate with me. I don't have to be legitimate with you. We're not responsible to give to every single person in the world. Okay. If they come to you, it's a different thing. In other words, if somebody is panhandling, but they have the sign, we can drive on by. Because they're not coming to me specifically. Mm -hmm. they're, it's a sign saying, yeah, I'm willing to work for food or wherever it's going to be. I can look at that and say, yeah, no, I, I don't think so. Or I know the guy's going to go to Cadillac Coup de Ville, which is parked around the corner. It may be that you know I don't have to do that. On the other hand, if somebody comes to me well, no, I, if I know that, if I, see, that's all the if I think the guy's not legit, so then it's, it changes the equation. I have to really be aware of what's legit, but if I don't think the guy's legit, I'm not going to give him anything. When people come to me in New York, which is every other street corner, you have somebody else putting their hand out at you. Yeah. I'm not going to call it snoring, but they put their hand out. I mean, everybody has their own headaches, but I'm not going to keep taking money out of my pocket to put money into their pocket. I don't know what, I don't know how much they're making a day. They're probably pulling in more than I do. Because <laughs> everybody's throwing in 25 cents, a dollar, whatever they're gonna give this guy. Unlike the guys who play guitar, now they're, I, I give them credit. Or sell pens on the street, I give them credit. You're trying to make business. I understand that. Whether or not I want to buy the pen every time, I don't know that's true either. But it's, again, you have to, you have to make your decision. Okay. Uh, and I think that that would be fair. Hashem doesn't expect us to give to the world. First, as, as a matter of fact, by the way, there are, there are degrees. In other words, if my family needs it, then I have to give it to my family over somebody else. Charity, that, that expression, charity begins at home, is a very Jewish expression, because that's what the halacha is. If, I, if my family needs it, I have to give it to my family. First me. God forbid. Then my family, God forbid. Then my extended family, God forbid. Then my neighbors, God forbid. They're all God forbid because I don't want anybody to need money. I don't want anybody to need anything. Okay, so it's, it goes out like that. And then if you've satisfied th that whole neighborhood, so then it goes out further and so on and so forth until the world. But it's uh, first, so even if the guy, so let's say that a poor guy comes to another poor guy Real schmuzzle. He comes to the poor guy. And so what does a halacha say? I'm supposed to listen to the person. Hear the sob story. Just, you know, I hear you, man. I hear it. It's hard. Like you did. It's hard. I'll, I'll give you something. I hear, here's a piece of food for you. It's all I got. You know, and you can do that. Uh, whenever somebody comes to my house, I always invite them in for a, a drink. Uh, uh, you know, you want a uh, soda, you want something, you want something to eat. I'm always that way because I hope that you have to do that. And then, like I said, the check I'm going to write out, I wouldn't, uh, they're not going to get a car on my part, but you know, I, I give them what I can, you know, what I, what I think that's proper at this juncture. Again, I don't know them from a hole in the wall. So I'm going by their, their green cards that they bring to me and say, this is what some rabbi checked them out and said, oh, fine, do this, like this. One, when I was in Canada, some guy came to my door and uh, 
He said to me, the, the, the old rabbi used to give me money. I said, you should find that rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to tell you, man. I'm not the old guy. He ran out of money. <laughs> <I> ran, <laughs> he's gone. So he said, all I need is $20. I said, what, what are you going to need? So he said, I just want to borrow it. I said, oh, you want to borrow it. See, if he would have said, I want to take it, and I don't, I never come, want to see you again, I would have understood that. But the guy said, borrow it. It's borrow. That's interesting. How, how long? We're going to pay it back? She said, I'm going to give it to you in one week. I said, okay, I'm going to tell you one thing right now. You're going to ruin it for everybody else. Phone straight up. So you're going to ruin it for everybody else. I'm going to give you $20. I'm going to give you 20 bucks. Came to my house, I'm going to give it to you. But you should understand one thing. If you don't return it in one week, that not only you, but any person who comes to me, all on you, is going to lose. You won't take the running box? So I said, yeah, I'm going to give it back. I said, here you go. It's the cheapest $20 I ever gave away. I guarantee it. And he didn't come back. Said, that's it. And so it's all on him now. It's all on him. I said, that's it. So all on you, man. Because I, I had nothing to do with it. You came to me. You may, and you said alone. If you were to say it, I need 20 bucks. Some girl came to me, I remember, I need $10 to put gas in my car, my kid's in the car. I said, you left your kid in the car to come to $10 for me? I said, go to the soup kitchen, I'll have $10 for you. I don't have that much, sorry. And what, pick a kid up, <laughs> don't leave a kid in the car. Because I knew she had no kid, I knew she had no car. So I, then I can, that's when you can be discerning and make that judgment. If you know the story is ridiculous, I left my kid in the car, I need gas. You're in the wrong area if you come to my show. There's no gas station, uh, not here, uh, in a different place. There's, there's no gas station in me that she suddenly needs gas. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, it's, it's a joke. She's going to all the different synagogues and churches to try to get it. I told them, go to the soup kitchen. They have, more, they have things for you. They have things for your children. They have, I didn't I call her a liar. So that's what it is. I gave her the address, go. They'll help you out. We, we pay them to do that. <laughs> So again, that's, when you, that's how you can be discerning. Okay. But if somebody comes and you have no reason to suspect them, so again, then you should, at the same way you want God to have compassion on you, you should have compassion on them. By the way, if somebody would come to you and say, I, I want you to forgive me, again, you have to understand why they want it, what's going on, but you want to emulate God. Just as we want God to forgive us, and let's face it, Let's face it, let me finish, let's face it. When we break the law, we know what we're doing. And we expect God to forgive us every single time. So here, if somebody does something bad to you, with the exception of Lashon Hara, of slander, I'm not getting to slander, but somebody does something wrong, so again, and they're coming to you for forgiveness, and they really mean it. They really mean it. So then, I'm not talking about a beating husband, I'm not talking about beating, I'm not talking about any stupid abuses here, that, that's ridiculous. But what I'm talking about is a real thing where they come to you and they, they're really, you sense that they really mean it. At that point, you're supposed to forgive them and not hold the grudge. Aren't they supposed to try and make restitution for the damage they've done? That that that's, the that that they have to. Huh? That, uh, you mean monetary? No, but they're supposed to try and make good what they did wrong, aren't they? I thought I read if, that. If it's, if it's uh, monetary. Uh. Anything else, what they're going to do. Like I said, Lush and Hara, I don't have to forgive anybody. If it's slander, you can't you can't repair the slander. But if it's something they broke my window, okay. So repair you have to pay the window off and then you, can, you should ask forgiveness and it's done. I shouldn't hold it against you. If somebody wants to borrow my rake, uh, I, actually I want to borrow their rake, and I say, Can I borrow your rake? And they say no. Okay. Now they come to me. Can I borrow your lawnmower? What should I say? I mean I, I'll test you. Gina, what should I say? Should I lend him a lawnmower or not? I, well, I'm not sure. Because did they, what was the reason why they couldn't? Doesn't did matter. They, doesn't matter? I don't care what the reason is. Doesn't I'm matter. Saying. Okay. So you would say yes. Why? Because the, you want to show them that you're gracious and giving so that can come back onto you. No. 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 Okay. <laughs> Why? Should you give it or not? Yeah. Why? Because it does, what they did has nothing, no bearing on how you should behave. Correct. 
the difference was what she said to what you just to make the point clear is if I give it to if I give the person a lawnmower and saying unlike you who wouldn't give me the the rake I'm a bigger person I'm going to give this that's what the Torah calls Natira holding a grudge I'm not allowed to do that and to say no I won't give it to you because you you didn't give it to me I won't give it to you that's another uh, wait the tira so it's not a grudge this, I'm translating it wrong there's one that's a grudge and one that's I'm I'm holding I'm just it's really both type of grudges revenge revenge it's a revenge you didn't do it to me I won't do it to you I, I you didn't give it to me I won't give it to you right that's revenge the other one like I said is holding a grudge where I, I'm showing you I'm better than you that's both are against the Torah yes I have to give it to them if I, if it's if it's a uh, logical thing to ask, so that I should lend it to you, but I shouldn't say, "Huh, oh, see, 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 I'm better than you are." That you're not allowed to do. Okay, so you got half the right. That's half credit. Okay, <laughs> that's the Torah. Torah is saying that to us, so we have to do that. If again, if it has to be within normal things. If they ask me, "Can I use your computer?" I'm no, under mm-hmm. no obligation to say yes to that because they can download a virus. So I, that's ridiculous. Or steal your information. That's something that, that's that horrible. But they they may download something, or they may do that. I don't have to give them them that. If they ask me for a lawnmower, then okay, it's not gonna. You pull the string. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll put gas in. What? What if it's expensive? If you think they're going to break it, don't give it to them. But that's a different reason. In other words, if I think that's my point about the computer, if, if it's something that's expensive that they may not handle properly, I'm not under no obligation to give it to you. On the other hand, if it's something that normally I would lend you, that's, I, that's the parameter. If normally I would lend it to you, and now I'm just holding it against you because you didn't do something for me. No. That's wrong. That's, wrong. that's, that's, all, that's a whole set of things. But if I wouldn't normally give it to you, absolutely not. I don't have to lend. Uh, people want to borrow cars. I'm not so much for that. And I hesitate greatly because, let's face it, a car is very expensive. You get into an accident, I lose a car, and you probably don't have insurance, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So I don't want to, And I'm not going to ask a person who wants to borrow my car, do you have an insurance that's paid up? It's just not the cool thing to do. It's much easier to say, I don't feel comfortable doing that and uh, but then again if you need their car they by rights can say the same thing to you and they probably will i don't know maybe some will give you the car i like i said giving cars is, is an expensive item giving computers expensive items when it comes to a lot more and if it's expensive the one that drives by itself and so on and so forth you may not want to lend it out i don't know but that's uh, for me i have the cheap one so it's a big deal. Someone wants to buy it, borrow it, borrow it. It's called a teenager. <laughs> teenager. I don't know about a teenager. Teenager, I may put my foot down and say, no, thank you. <laughs> because they don't care about anything. No, I mean a lawnmower. No, it's your cheap lawnmower. Oh, children, children children the, right, right. <laughs> right. They, they're not cheap either. That's why I mow the lawn myself. <laughs> But that, that, but that's the point of this. Okay, we went over a long thing, but that's, that would be the point. If I, whatever, ad, whatever attribute I want God to keep in this world, I have to emulate. That's what Tom Devaro says. It's another book. That's what Tom Devaro says. So it's, it's something, if, like I said, if you want, the example would be to forgive somebody. Not a heinous crime. Again, a normal situation. If somebody asks you for forgiveness, just you should give it to them wholesale and not worry that oh, I, I'm going to teach you a lesson. Who are you to teach a lesson? And on top of that, God will say to you, oh, you felt that way about my person. But guess what? Now you come to me, I'm, going to, I'm not going to forgive you so quickly either. So whatever we, whatever we want to emulate, that's what comes back to us. Okay. Uh, so the Ramchal indicates here that the primary purpose of the soul is to purify the body, not necessarily to give it life. He is also stating that the second reason why the soul would get, uh, that right why the soul would gain 
if it could achieve the full effects of its actions in this world. For whenever someone acts to carry out the purpose of his creation, it becomes perfected through the performance of that act, independent of the good accomplished through the act by simply fulfilling the divine will. Okay, so now let's go back to this. So uh, the Ramchal now concludes that his explanation of what the soul gains Oh, I'm sorry. Now concludes his explanation of what the soul gains in Olam and Neshama. Remember, that's where the 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 uh, soul was kept after it was separated from the body. So it says, however, when the soul exits the body and comes into the Olam and Neshama, the world of souls, there there it is no longer suppressed, and therefore radiates outwardly and shines fully as is befitting it based upon its actions in this world, which means that if it didn't do well, then it's not going to radiate that much. So it all depends on what we do in this world. So our body is helping our soul, our soul is helping our body again. It's, the, it's a partnership going on. Uh, and uh, what it attains while it is there in Olam HaNeshamot strengthens it from the weakening effect of the body which is he said the soul was weakened within the body compared to the state that it should have attained based on its own actions okay and it thereby became becomes more prepared from uh from what it is meant to accomplish for what it is meant to accomplish at the time of resurrection and uh okay so that is and gun aiden he says is not merely a type of waiting room there is an active preparation in the Olam HaNashamot for the soul to increase its level and to reach its full potential so that it will be able to, to function at the highest degree possible at the time of Tichiet HaMetim, which is revival of the dead. So according to this, the this Neshama does not get time off of good behavior. It's going to uh, be put into the Olam HaNashamot. Then it has to go through this active preparation in order that when it reunites with the body, we'll be able to get the body to its level of perfection. So we all think that when we get to, when we die, that it's our time to relax. As my mother would say, she, uh, when I would tell her, Ma, I want to go to sleep, she says, I have plenty of time to sleep. <laughs> that means it's in the grave. <laughs> and apparently, according to, if I would have read her the Ramchal, she should have got her sleep because she, her soul needs to sleep at the Okay, she the soul gets it doesn't uh, take time off. This helps so that when the soul returns to the body at the appropriate time, it will be accomplished. It will be, I'm sorry. It will be able to accomplish within the body the task that is proper for the soul, namely the purification that we have already mentioned. And he says that the Ramchal cites midrash Hana Alim which states that the Olam HaNeshamot, in the Olam HaNeshamot, the soul basks in the radiance of the Shekhinah, which is God's divine presence, and it, it and is encompassed by it. When the soul returns to the body, it does so with, with that very radiance. And he adds that even in Gan Eden, the soul provides whatever illumination is needed for the body while it is becoming cleansed with the evil. By the way, another thing that you can learn from this that when you're with the Shekhinah, God's divine presence, you radiate. And that would give an example, that would, you would see this from the Torah when Moshe comes down with his second tablets and his, his, it says his face radiated with horns of light. Karen Orr. No, oh, they mistranslated. No, 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 no. That's Karen, Karen, Karen Hold. Uh, horns, literally, horns of glory. Can it be also translated as beams that's what it should have been translated into English and they translated as into horns that's why Michelangelo put I know I, I understand I understand why he put horns there I understand it was that's what translation but Karen I, I no I don't I, I in English they're going to do that but really Karen is horn Karen is horn it, it means beams of light. That's what it means clearly, but it does. Is so his face is a glow. It's what? an idiomatic expression. Right, right, right. Uh, that they mistranslate. Right, no, one hundred percent. We don't have horns. 
No, we don't. Okay, I just made sure. <laughs> but uh, no, of course, it was a bad translation. But that's where Michelangelo got it. And that's why when I was traveling with the yeshiva, we got to Georgia, Georgia. And we stopped and to, uh, there was a rest stop there. So we stopped and, and these good old boys came in. To the, they came to the van and they saw they were Jews. And they said, you boys got horns and tails? I never thought I would see it. I never thought I would hear it in my life. Here I was a 25-year-old kid, I guess. 23, 24. Well, something like that. Of Semites. Why would you be surprised? I never heard it. I never heard that somebody would actually have the, the guts to do that. So he came because he thought we were all skinny and everything else. We had a football player on the, the van with us. This guy is 6'5". And if he was anything under 300 pounds, you know, and he got up. They weren't, they didn't know he was in the van. And he got up and he went out to them. They were only about 5'6", whatever, 5'7". He said, you boys want to repeat that? Like, no, sir. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> they walked away. <laughs> they ran away. <laughs> See, he was like, oh, I'm ready to rumble. You know, anything you want. <laughs> the guy's three pounds. <laughs> but, uh, but that was my first, that was probably my first vaunt into that sort of anti -Semitism. I've dealt with anti Semitism, but never like that. <laughs> Where are you on tails? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I never thought I would hear that. But, no, no. I, I think that's Georgia. I think they were actually yanking your chain. What year was this? I was back in a uh, yeshiva, so you're going into the uh, 80s. Because I lived in Atlanta and surroundings in the early 70s. And there were certainly rednecks. There were well, I, said, rednecks. I said good old boys. I didn't say that they're all the choice. But, but they're, you know, I, running across people quite that ignorant. <laughs> In the 80s? No, I think they were yanking you. You didn't run across people that ignorant, right? They're now. right here. <laughs> no, people here, they beep and want to run you off the road. That was my initial, that was, that was what I ran into here. I was walking on Twickenham, and I was walking on the street with some, with another Jewish guy, and within the white lines, you know, what they call the bike lanes right now. Right now. But uh, the guy beeped and really cut close. I was like, what are you, crazy? And I, it's unbelievable. I, that, I wasn't expecting that in 2000, um, 2007. Or the woman up by HOC who asked me, don't you people have a place to park your car? Do you have to park on the street in front of my house? <laughs> no, but that, you'd get that plenty around here. It's amazing, actually. It's a machine. It's, it's an amazing thing. But you have a lot of interest in it. You also have the KKK here. Yeah, no, I'm How far away are they, 14 miles? Uh, From here, I thought well, they were in Georgia. You know the Georgia. Grand Dragon, don't you? Or Alabama? No, 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 no. They're right here. Really? Elkhart, I think Elkhart. No. Osceola. 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 Really? They're right here. They're right here. Richard. When I when when I was coming, uh, before I came to the Midwest, so in Skokie, I remember they had a Holocaust thing. Uh, they had a march. The AKK had a march, and uh, so the Holocaust neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, and that. And we were watching that. I was thinking, unbelievable. The, the, you know, the, the chutzpah, the nerve of these people. Then you told me that uh, they they march in South Bend really? through the Jewish neighborhood, the old Jewish neighborhood. With Nazi flags. Yeah. And so then, when I was coming here, they told me that it's 40 miles away from us. So it's a uh, it's an amazing thing. And you know, main office used to be in Plymouth. Where's Plymouth? South, about south 30, 40 miles. South. Okay, there you go. It's, not, it's very much alive. The anti Semitism is very much alive. And now you're seeing it really come out from people. It's amazing. It's, we it's, all know where it came from, don't we? Asaph and Yaakov. <laughs> okay, but <laughs> that's where it started. Uh, let's continue. So, but the, it was a lot of it. But like I said, that was it was it was the first thing that I felt going to, to, to Georgia. I'll never forget that story. <laughs> but okay, I mean I can laugh at it, but it, it was so ridiculous. But Pro Hashem, we didn't have to get into a fight over. But we had a football player there. <laughs> By the way, that football player, just uh, the postscript to that, is a ra He's a rabbi today, 
And he's quoted many times around here, even Rabbi Label Lamb. Hmm. That's who it was. And uh, it was, uh, he's since lost his growth of 300 pounds. He's a rabbi now. <laughs> so, he's still a tall guy, but he's not, uh, he's not 300 pounds anymore. He's much skinnier. But it's, uh, however, okay, let's continue. So the Ramchal elaborates on the soul's interaction with the body. He says, however, you need to know that even now, after the sin of Adam Arishon, when the soul enters the body in its present transient state, although the soul has, yet, has not yet acquired perfection through its deeds, uh, it would be proper for it to impart intense purification of the material body to the degree that it would transcend being categorized as that of mere mortals. So he says that when the soul first entered the body, the, the person has obviously not performed any mitzvot, which would lead to his perfecting himself. Rather, he would be like a malach, like uh, an angel, like Chanoch, who was transformed into an angelic body and soul, even before the person performs any deeds that could lead to his perfection. The mere act of the soul entering the body should suffice to bring about a major transformation to the body to the degree that the person should cease to be part of humanity as we know it. However, the divine decree suppresses the soul, hiding its strength and lessening its radiance in such a way that it will not result in this. And uh, he says, the Ramchal writes that the moon is symbolic of, the, of this lessening of the soul's power. For the moon, too, had its illumination lessened upon creation, and the future will shine like the sun. And this has to, it's an interesting story that goes with that. I'm trying to just to make sure everybody knows it, the sun, the, the sun and the moon, according to the, uh, if you look in the text, were two giant lights. If you look at the text, the straight Hebrew, they were two giant lights. Then it says, and the moon was the lesser and the sun was the greater. So the, the question is, well, why don't you say that from the beginning? Why do you have to say there are two great lights? So the, the story goes like this. The moon says to God, Master of the universe, it's not proper to have two kings in the world. If we're both the same, we're both, uh, we, can't, we don't share kingdoms. So God said, you're 100% correct. The sun will be the king and you'll be the, uh, the prince. I'm going to shrink you down. Okay, so he gets punished for being, if he, saying the truth. He would say he was saying the truth. And he was, but okay, so you brought it up. So I'm going to shrink you down. Good. That light, that moon which has shrunk down in the future, it says, will be as uh, when the Mashiach comes, that will be increased, so that, that it will have its own light and be as strong as the sun. What's that, what is that going to do to our solar system? I'm not getting involved in that, okay? I'm just going with what the Midrash says, but that's what he's referring to here. When he says that the moon is symbolic of the lessening of the soul's power, the soul should be able to... Uh, our soul, which is so pure, should come into our outer bodies, shine like crazy, and our bodies should just be nullified by that and brought to the state of perfection, if not for Adam's sin. When Adam put that sheath over us, as it were, that, that uh, husk, what we call the klipa in Hebrew, so that is what started to cause all the headaches. Again, the soul is strong. It has the power, but God dampens it down just a bit so that it doesn't take over everything and yet it has the power to do so let's remember it again i don't want to take that away it has the power to, to perfect us as much as possible with death of course being the final uh step uh second not next to final step whether well, penultimate step there you go <laughs> could use that big word okay uh yeah so And it says, rather, the soul will reside there enclosed within itself to whatever extent deemed necessary by the divine intent. And during this time, it, it affects the body within that framework and measure that is deemed acceptable by Hashem's wisdom. So it says, the soul is subdued to the degree that is necessary for it not to destroy the balance that exists between one's Yitzhah and one's Yitzhah to allow freedom of choice. 
but not to the degree that are prevented from purifying the body at the appointed time. And this indicates that even now that the soul has some effect upon the body, Rav Chaim uh, Friedlander notes that we can observe that a Torah scholar is more refined and less earthy than a person who is, con- uh, than a person who is controlled by his physical desires. And this is something that, we, again, we'll have to stop here, but this is something that we have to always remember, that the more we sensitize ourselves, the more we do what we're supposed to do, and through that sensitize ourselves, the more we grow. But we don't realize it. And we always think that we haven't done enough. I compare it, and I love doing this because I compare it to weight loss. No matter how much weight I lose, personally, I don't see it. I don't even see it when I gain the weight. I just see it as normal because I'm seeing myself every day. So... What I notice is when I can't run as fast and so on and so forth, I can notice that. But for the most part, I don't realize when I've lost the weight, except if my clothes don't fit. On the other hand, when you lose or gain weight, I know right away. Because I'm seeing you from a different perspective. So when, with ourselves, no, no matter how much we work on ourselves spiritually, we still think that we're back there in the old days. Until we're confronted with a situation in which... We, we, something happens that we we realize, wow, I'm, I don't belong here anymore, which is a very nice thing, and that's why I've been away from smokers, Baruch Hashem, for a long time. So when I go into an, an environment that there is smoke, I feel it very bad. It really it gets me. I start choking right away, as compared to when, like I said, when I was growing up. <laughs> smoke all day long who cares i didn't it didn't affect me i wasn't coughing but once i went to college actually and i was separated from that and i wasn't around smokers uh, in the dorms they didn't smoke if they did they didn't smoke near me i don't know but the uh, so and you know you you get you become sensitized and that's what was going on here so when i'm with people who are not uh as religious or whatever the case is, if I'm not in this environment, and there's if I go into a New York, I'm much and I'm in that that milieu of of orthodoxy. So then I'm I become more sensitized to what they're doing. And when I come back here, oh wherever I am, not here, but when I would go to another place, not because here's here we have Baruch Hashem, a nice uh, from area, but if you go to a place that is not so from so then you feel that and you say, wow, I had one thing here, I have another thing here. And that's the sense that that's how we do it. But we become used with quite quickly. Don't ever forget that. We become very quickly. If God forbid I would be thrust into a smoking situation again, I, it wouldn't take long to, to get used to that smell and everything else, even though I wouldn't want to. But it would, again, when I went home to my mother when she was alive, it took me a uh, an hour, two hours, or so I'll be, and I'll be back to where I was. Because you don't, you don't sense it, and you know where else it is in a party. You don't hear the noise. You ever go to a party and you're there, and first you can't hear anything. It's so loud, so loud, and then you're there for a, about an hour, and you can have a conversation like this, with the music blasting. We learn to zone things out, and that's become we become desensitized very, very quickly. To these things and that's what he's saying the soul with all those problems that it has it we the soul can always shine through it has that radiance it has it we just have to want it to come out and if it comes out if we want to come out it will come out and then people will see our face shining and that's the shining with the glow of happiness whatever that's going to be or of course the the other side where people are sad they have that and people say why are you sad the person says i'm not sad i'm not sad no, why are you sad? I'm not sad. Why? <laughs> so it's awful. Okay, we'll stop there.